Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone to our pre-med star webinar. Uh, get through here. Sure. Alrighty, so jumping right in here. All right, so all of you should see the questions here displayed on the screen. And this first one here is from Millen from Eastern Mennonite University. And he's wondering if Ohio State accepts some online prerequisites. Yes, yes, we do, uh, Millen. So first of all, Lauren, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, yes, yes, Millen, we do. Um, we, uh, we, have, uh, we do have uh, an online uh, coursework policy, uh, and, and essentially it states that um, we uh, want the online course to be taken uh, at, uh, at a university that is accredited through one of the major accrediting uh, bodies of colleges and universities in the United States. And uh, um, we uh, uh, would like it to be uh, at a place that has a proctored final exam. Now, we know that uh, uh, that last condition may not be met, but uh, we handle those on a case-by-case -case basis if there's not a proctored final exam. But yes, we do accept online courses for prerequisites provided they are uh, given by an accredited university. Um, and uh, that last point about it having a proctored final exam, uh, we'll uh, uh, look at that on a case-by-case basis. So hopefully that helps. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, let's go on into the next one here. So regarding medical school interviews, once you get there, um, we know that how you look and present yourself is very important. What color suit would you recommend pre-meds wear to stand out, but also not to be far out of line in terms of professionalism? You know, so that's a, that's a good one. And uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time speaking to pre-med students. In fact, we have uh, uh, a pre-med uh, bi-monthly uh, Q&A session where we answer the questions and they are scheduled to be right before our medical school interviews. And so one thing I like to do is I like to, uh, as we finish the Q&A session, I walk the pre-med students down past the medical school interviewees so they can see what everybody is wearing. And uh, here's the long and short of it. As usual, uh, and this is a little unfair, uh, guys, and I'm saying this kind of humorously, women have more options than men, uh, so we know that. Um, <laughs> for men, uh, it's gotta be a suit and it should be a dark color. So if you were to look at uh, uh, at our interviewees on interview day, if you're a real fashionista, you would be bored because uh, uh, it's dark colors and all the men have on either black or very dark blue or dark gray suits. Now the women uh, uh, generally also dress conservatively in dark colors, but women can kind of get away with uh, lighter colors. Um, but uh, generally you want to be dark uh, colors. Now you can add as much flash as fashion as you want gentlemen to your ties but um, but uh, on interview day uh, you can as, as we like to joke you can always tell in a hospital or in a medical school when it's interview day because you look for all the people in the dark suits with the big name tags so uh, <laughs> women women can be a little more uh, creative and uh, don't necessarily have to have on dark or navy dark uh, you know navy blue or black or dark gray um, but uh, you don't want to be uh, bright yellow you don't want to be bright colors, you don't want to be bright stripes, bright polka dots or anything like that. Save that for your accessories. So if it's a scarf, if it's a tie, and you want to add a little drama, that's okay. But uh, the main core of your suit should be um, uh, relatively conservative. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Dr. Kippers and Divya. That was a great question. I think oftentimes we over um, think these little things, but also don't take into account how much our nonverbal communication plays a role. And so building off of that, Jocelyn's wondering, how does one really get a feel of the school when visiting for an interview? One of the most important ways to do that is talking to the current students. So just about all schools where you interview, they will have some current students come to meet you. Most likely they will have lunch with you and they will be the ones that give you on a tour. That is uh, my, my advice is to really get a feeling in your gut for uh, the current students, uh, if they are happy, what you want to see is that they're working hard uh, because medical school is, uh, is a challenge. It'll challenge you. But what you want to see is that they're working hard, but they're enjoying themselves. Uh, you want to see that there are people that you think you could spend a lot of time with because in medical school, you're going to spend a lot more time with your classmates than you are with the faculty. So the best way to get a feel for that school and whether it's right for you 
is, of course, the obvious things like look at the curriculum, um, uh, how they grade and things like that. But I'd say one of the most important things is getting a feel for the current students. Perfect. And Jacqueline is wondering, this is a bit specific with each school. So at Ohio State, is there a scale system that dictates how you guys review students selected for an interview? Um, or, and how does this really tie into a holistic approach review? Yes, uh, we use at, uh, and it can, it can vary from school to school, but most medical schools are, are, are trying to be holistic these days. Uh, holistic review is, is in our DNA at Ohio State. Uh, we uh, uh, both at the screening uh, process, and that's where our faculty members look at an application and decide if you should uh, be uh, uh, interviewed. Uh, and also at the interview, and then also at the selection process, we use holistic review and uh, the AAMC uh, defined holistic review is that medical school should put uh, emphasis on your application in the following ways. One third of the, your overall score, if you will, should be from your experiences. Things like uh, for us at Ohio State, those are research, community service, healthcare related experiences and leadership experiences. So that's one third. Another third are your personal attributes things about you uh, that will make you a good doctor. At Ohio State, we define those as communication skills, collegiality, critical thinking, uh, compassion, and service orientation. That's the second third. And the final third, you could probably guess what that is. Those are your academic metrics, your GPA and your MCAT. So one third of your overall evaluation will come from your experiences. Another third will come from your personal attributes that we can tell from your written personal statement and letters of recommendation. And the final third will come from your academic metrics. All of that goes into giving you a score, whether it's a score to decide whether or not you get an interview, or if you've interviewed, a score to decide uh, whether or not you will be accepted. All right, perfect. And so you just kind of commented on the holistic approach. Um, let's see. A way for Jacqueline to get a little bit more from here. How how should we look at holistic review in our pre-med preparation? How should we take that into account in deciding which activities we do and so forth? Well, uh, simply simply put, you want to be well-rounded. So so again, if a, if a third of your evaluation is going to depend on your experiences, and a third your personal attributes, and a third your academic metrics. Then, uh, then you can see how it would be a mistake to say, um, you know, I'm not going to do any community service. I'm not going to do any healthcare related experience or any research. I'm going to sit here and study, study, study so I can get a 4.0 and so that I can really rock the MCAT. Well, that would be a mistake because you would have a very good score for your academic metrics, but then uh, poor scores uh, for experiences and uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, how you come across, maybe not the best course for your personal attributes. So as you are thinking about the fact that you will be viewed through a holistic review lens, think about being uh, well, uh, uh, well balanced. So think about your experiences. Are your experiences showing uh, that you've gone out of your way to have some experiences that are gonna make you a good doctor? Uh, do you have some healthcare related experience? Uh, do you have some leadership experiences? Uh, do you have some research experiences? Do you have some community service experiences? Uh, and then think about your personal attributes. Are your best personal attributes coming through on your application? Uh, did you select the right letter writers that can write about your best qualities, your critical thinking, your collegiality, your compassion, etc.? So as you are pre-med and working towards the day when you apply to medical school, think experiences, attributes and academic metrics and you want to be strong in each of those three major categories perfect thank you for touching on that let's see so andrew from hofstra is wondering what quality do you look for the most in a medical school applicant well so that's a hard question to answer uh, i will tell you andrew that a few years ago we uh, uh, we surveyed our medical school admissions committee uh, and we asked, uh, we asked them this question, and actually this is on our website. If you go to the OSU College of Medicine and look on our admissions page, 
we actually have a lot of things there that are meant to be helpful to you. And one of the things you'll find is a survey that we did. We put it in the form of a PowerPoint and uh, the name of that PowerPoint, just so you'll know what to look for is, what will the admissions committee think? So this gives you a look uh, at, at the uh, inner workings of how our admissions committee thinks. Well, one of the questions that we asked them was this. Um, um, in which of these scenarios should a, a student be denied admission to Ohio State University? A, this was a multiple choice question, A, uh, someone who has strong academic metrics and is otherwise a strong candidate but completely lacks healthcare related experience. B was everything else is outstanding but they completely lack research experience. Uh, the next C was everything is very strong, but they completely lack community service. And 75% uh, uh, said that the student who completely lacks community service should not be accepted to Ohio State University. So uh, we take that, uh, the way I answer your question is, it seems that our admissions committee feels that uh, you can certainly have some deficits in your application, but a complete lack of community service uh, should uh, nobody with a complete lack of community service should be accepted to Ohio State University. So hopefully that answers your question in terms of what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody to be well-rounded and strong in all areas, but I guess you can say we put the most emphasis in those experiences is on your heart for service and your compassion for serving others. Okay, great question there. And Miracle from Syracuse is wondering if you can explain the structure of an MMI. Yeah, yes, we do not do MMIs uh, at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Our dental school uh, actually does uh, MMIs, uh, but I can, I can give you the basics of it. Uh, they're set up to see uh, how you respond to a question that was asked to you right before you sat down in front of a group of two or three people. And uh, you're graded on how you answer that question, and there's a little bit of pressure. So it's almost like uh, the term that people usually like to use is um, um, uh, serial, uh, uh, what do they call that, serial dating, or <laughs> where, you, where you go from table to table to table to table. So um, uh, you, you go to the first room, there's a question outside the room written on a piece of paper, you read that question, then you go in and you answer the question. Then you go to the next room then the next room, on and on. And the people in there are grading you on your answers to that question. Uh, this was it's thought to be a good way to take away some of the uh, subjectivity uh, in medical school interviews and being more objective. Because in this sense, uh, each group of committee members who are grading you, uh, let's say the school interviews 10 people that day, each group of two or three, they're interviewing the students and grading them on the same exact question. So, uh, so that hopefully tells you a little bit about the, the MMI. Perfect, thank you. And uh, before we get into Tyra's question here, maybe if you'd like to take a minute just to share about Ohio State's approach to interviewing. Yes, so we have, uh, so at Ohio State, we do not do the MMI, as I said, we do, mm -hmm. we do two one-on-one -on -one interviews. So when you interview at Ohio State, you're gonna be interviewed by a faculty member and by a trainee. That trainee is either a medical student uh, or a, a, a resident. We have our residents help us out. So uh, a full, uh, one way to think of it as a full-fledged faculty member and a trainee. Both of those people will grade you uh, they both have uh, equal input, and uh, so you come out of your interview day with two interview reports, so to speak. Then, several days later, uh, a third person on the admissions committee member uh, on the admissions committee will read, um, and this is when we're meeting as a group. They will read those interview reports and summarize them, present you to a room full of people, and that's where we discuss you and have a final vote. The interview itself is blinded to academic metrics. So your interviewer at the time of the interview will not know your grades or your MCAT or anything about your academic record. They'll know everything else. They'll have your letters of recommendation. They'll have your experiences uh, and everything else on your AMCAS application and your secondary application, but uh, they will not see your academic record. So they are gonna be grading you essentially on your experiences and your attributes. 
Then several days later, when we actually deliberate and vote, this third member of the committee will uh, look at everything and now they have your unblinded file. So now they see your grades and then we put together your experiences and attributes as graded by the interviewers who didn't know anything about your grades and uh, the uh, final deliberator who's presenting you to the group who now sees your academic record. That's our system. And you come out of that, everybody comes out of that with an overall score. And that score then determines who is accepted, who is deferred, and who is rejected. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for covering that. And you did mention that you're going to have two different interviews, one with a faculty member and one with a trainee. In those interviews, what types of questions are typically asked? Well, so if you think about the thing, so, so go back to um, um, uh, what I told you about our uh, uh, experiences. So experiences, attributes, and metrics. So the experiences that are important to us, there are four, and we actually grade you on them. Um, research experiences, leadership experiences, community service experiences, and healthcare related experiences. So you will be asked questions about those experiences based on what we see on what you wrote on your application. And we'll ask you questions about, uh, to, to kind of stimulate your deep thought about those experiences. What did you get out of it? So you, so you volunteered at a nursing home last summer. What did you learn about service? What did you learn about uh, giving to others? What did you learn about uh, life and death? Um, uh, tell us how this is gonna make you a better doctor. So that's kind of an example where we're trying to get you to think deeply about your experience. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clearing that up. And next, um, I'll go ahead and skip this one because Taylor, that was kind of related to what Dr. Capers just explained. And Junie has a good question here. She's from Oakwood University and she's wondering what are some things to avoid during the interview? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. So first of all, let me say this. Um, our medical students on the admissions committee and our faculty members have equal input. So we've had some unbelievable uh, mistakes where the uh, applicant, the candidate, got a little too comfortable with the medical student because of course the medical student is a little closer to you in age and uh, we've had, and that is meant to relax you a little bit, but we've had candidates to get too relaxed. Uh, you probably won't believe it, but I'll tell you, we actually had one candidate when they were interviewing with the faculty member very professional when they were interviewing with the medical student uh, they actually took their shoes off oh wow now uh, every time I say that people chuckle but I, I swear that is the truth now listen I know that maybe you've got a new pair of shoes on and maybe your feet are bothering you but you just need to suffer through it and smile until you get home, or at least until you're in the cab on your way back to the airport. Um, uh, as you can imagine, that made that medical student interviewer feel like, well, this candidate doesn't respect me uh, if they would do that. We've also had uh, candidates to use profanity in their uh, medical school interview with the medical students. They don't do that with the faculty, but with the medical students. So the moral of that story is, um, you, uh, if, if a medical school is using medical students to interview you, then they think a lot of those medical students and uh, uh, don't get so relaxed that you get overly casual uh, with uh, the medical students. That means keep it professional, um, watch your language, uh, don't slouch. We've also had uh, occasionally a candidate who, again, very professional with the faculty, then when they interview with the medical student, kind of slump and slouch in their chair and get comfortable. Keep your A game. Uh, whether you're interviewing with a senior faculty member or a second year medical student. Okay, great question, Junie. And Stephanie from University of Hawaii is wondering what should applicants do to stand out? Yeah, so similar to kind of what we've been saying here, uh, you're going to be graded on your experiences, your attributes, and your academic metrics. And of course, the easy thing to say is try to be as, as strong as you are in each of those three major categories. Um, when you write about your experiences, that is your chance to say what you got out of those experiences. That's really what you should be doing. Don't think of it as a list. On the medical school application, you have space to write about 15 experiences. It's not a list. So you don't just want to say, 
worked as a lifeguard last summer, a nursing home two summers ago, research project in organic chemistry. You want to list, you want to uh, uh, name it, but then you have a paragraph to say what you got out of it. What did you get out of this experience that's going to help you uh, be a better doctor? And this is where applicants can stand out uh, by telling your story, but through those experiences. If you were waiting tables at a restaurant, what did you learn that's going to help you be a better doctor? If you were tutoring your classmates, what did you learn that's going to help you be a better doctor? So that's the way you should approach your essay, and that's the way you should approach these paragraphs that follow each of your experiences. Okay, perfect. And let's see, Clement kind of builds off of this and he's wondering if there's any must use or deal breakers that could um, happen after the interview. After the interview, um, uh, no deal breakers because you've, you've already done, uh, you've already done uh, what you need to do and made your impression on interview day. Uh, I guess I might say um, uh, to, to call uh, uh, excessively, you know, some medical schools uh, really try to have a short turnaround time between your interview and your actual decision. Others might be a little bit longer. It's okay to call once, you know, if it's been a couple of weeks and you're calling to say, hey, I'm just calling to check on the status of my uh, application I interviewed two weeks ago. That's okay, but you don't wanna call repeatedly. Um, uh, so I guess that could, I'm not saying that that would be a deal breaker, but, uh, but that is a way that you don't wanna uh, come across as being um, um, uh, uh, annoying or irritating to the admissions office staff. Uh, must do's, I'm glad you brought that up because there's this thought out there that you must write a thank you note. Um, you don't, you don't have to, uh, in fact, most admissions deans and admissions office directors and even admissions uh, staff uh, are pretty busy. Is it nice to get a nice uh, uh, Hallmark greeting card from an interviewee saying, hey, I really enjoyed my interview there? Uh, yes, it's nice. Uh, however, please don't think that you must. Please don't think that if you don't, it somehow puts you at a disadvantage. Because when I get a card, and I get a lot of them because probably, um, uh, and the, the paranoia of being pre-meds, uh, pre-meds feel like, oh, if I don't do this, uh, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna put me at a disadvantage. So we get a lot of them, but I can tell you from the time I open the card and it says, uh, hi, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Mary and I enjoyed my time at Ohio State. Thank you very much. I really like Ohio State. Uh, from the time I read that to the time we are discussing candidates, I've completely forgotten who sent the card and who didn't. So. Um, I'm glad to be able to dispel uh, this myth. You have enough things stressing you out. Please don't feel like if you go on 16 interviews that you have to write 16 thank you notes. If you want to and you feel like you have time and it's not stressing you out, then okay if you must. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna, I'm trying to take the pressure off of you and let you know that that is not necessary and it does not put you at a disadvantage if you didn't do it. Awesome, thank you. I don't think any of us knew that about the thank you letters. And let's see, Aisha here is wondering, how are grades addressed in an interview? Um, so we, uh, we no longer, uh, our interviewers no longer see your grades. Uh, but before when they did, uh, they, they might ask you about a certain grade and then you just, uh, you're, you're, you're just forthright and you just talk about it. So at schools that do not do metrics blinded interviews, um, for instance, somebody might ask, uh, so I see in your uh, second semester of chemistry, uh, you got a D in the lab portion. Can you tell me what was going on there? And then that's your time to explain to them that uh, maybe something extraordinary was going on in your life uh, and you couldn't give it full attention, but then to point out to them, but oh, as you see next semester, I got an A in the lab portion. So that was a bad semester. You know, I broke my leg, my dog died. Uh, I was working 30 hours a week in addition to having a full load, uh, but I, I learned something about it and I got it together after that. So, so at schools that still review your grades before they interview you, uh, that may be an example of a question. And the best advice is to just be forthright and, and talk about exactly what happened. Okay, perfect. And just kind of going off of this, since you guys don't discuss grades at the interview directly, 
Um, how would you suggest an applicant address any discrepancies in their grades? Would that be something they would do in the secondary or maybe in their personal statement? Or which ways would you recommend they kind of explain themselves to your guys' admissions committee? So there, there are a couple of ways to do that. And uh, one is through the personal statement. So again, if you had uh, a bad semester or a bad year, or if you are like many college students that when they were in high school, uh, they uh, were so much smarter than their classmates that they were able to study for the exam the night before the exam and still get A's. And then you go into college <laughs> with that same mentality and get a rude awakening freshman year of college. If you're like many people and that happened to you and your freshman year grades um, don't reflect uh, what you can really do. And then after that, your sophomore and junior year, you got it together and learned how to study as a college student. Um, then uh, you would like to explain that. So you can either explain that in your personal statement, people have done it there, or at the interview. Uh, even though we have uh, structured interviews where we're asking people the same question, uh, we've trained our faculty and our medical students and residents to end the interview by saying, is there anything else you'd like to tell? Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that, you know, this is your time, to either ask questions or tell me anything you want to tell me. And that's the time for you to say, oh, by the way, just wanted to let you know my freshman year, um, I didn't really have a good idea of how to study in college. And it took me uh, a couple of semesters to really get my footing. Uh, but uh, now I fully understand how to be a good student, how to make lists, how to keep deadlines. And uh, as you see, the rest of my grades uh, reflect that. So just wanted to make that clear to you. So that will be the time for you to do that. When, when they say, so what questions do you have for me? Or uh, is there anything that you would like to tell me? Okay, perfect. And so I think T, this one had an answered your question as well. And Jocelyn, we'll go ahead and touch on this a little bit more. Um, in the interview, if let's say they ask a question on identifying any weaknesses, how do you recommend pre-meds address questions like this? Uh, about your weaknesses, um, and, and we ask for questions like this. <laughs> so let me give you a hint. Um, uh, and we always say this at our medical uh, school admissions committee training. We all chuckle about the answer to this question. Uh, what could you, tell me about an aspect, uh, Lauren, of your approach to the world where you feel like you could improve? Or what can you do better? Or tell me about something that's not your strongest point. Uh, and when a student says, uh, I work too hard, <laughs> or uh, I care too much. <laughs> you know, we chuckle because that's not genuine. Um, uh, so what you want to say is uh, we all have weaknesses. We all have things that we could be doing better. And uh, it's okay to go ahead and talk about those, but you don't want to leave it there. Uh, let me give you an example. If you were to, if you were interviewing me, Lauren, and you mm -hmm. said, okay, Quinn, uh, what, uh, uh, tell me about uh, an area uh, that needs improvement. And I were to say, well, you know, I'm a procrastinator. I, 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 uh, uh, and that's a problem. I, I kind of wait to the last minute uh, to get things done. It would be a big mistake for me to say that and then just leave it at that. Right. What I would need to follow that up with is, but I realize that's a problem and I'm working on it. Uh, I've talked to some counselors and advisors. They've given me some good tips about making lists uh, checking those lists uh, two times a day. Um, and, you know, and so I'm working on it. So this is an area where I need improvement and I'm working on it. That's what admissions committees like to hear. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that helps. I definitely think so. And let's see, Miguel here brings up a great point. Of course, going into an interview, you should have practiced and anticipated the types of topics you'd like to discuss. And so Miguel is kind of wondering, how do you find the balance between practicing um, and having good answers versus sounding very robotic and rehearsed? Uh, it's a funny question because the answer is funny and uh, the way you uh, not sound rehearsed is uh, rehearsing. <laughs> so, 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 so more practice, more, uh, more uh, practice interviews uh, if you can. Uh, it's interesting, some committee members uh, uh, will uh, ding a student if they feel like it was a canned answer. It, they came in with that answer. Um, and I tend to disagree with that because I can tell you I've interviewed for lots of positions in my career. 
starting with medical school, then residency and fellowship and on and on and on. And I've never had an interview where I didn't practice, where I didn't rehearse, where I didn't have some canned answers, where I hadn't thought it out and said, okay, if they ask me this, then this is the answer I'm gonna give. And if they follow up with a question uh, saying this, then this is gonna be my answer to that follow So I always practice when I have interviews. So I don't think it's a bad thing to practice for interviews. The trick is to sound uh, like uh, you just thought of that answer and to not sound uh, robotic uh, and like it's an interview. And that just comes with more practice. A hint from an admissions committee interviewer that your uh, answer is rehearsed is when you give that answer, whether or not they've asked that question, if you know what I mean. Uh, sometimes when we're nervous and we go in with some canned answers and somebody asks the question, which that answer doesn't exactly answer, but <laughs> since we've practiced that answer, we go ahead and give that answer. That's a dead giveaway to the interviewer that, okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, something that he rehearsed. But the answer is uh, more practice. And I see Miguel is from The Ohio State University, OH. OH. <laughs> oh ho hopefully somewhere uh, Miguel is saying IO. I know we have a couple of Ohio State University <laughs> attendees in the audience here. Okay, and Aliyah is wondering, you did mention practice, 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 but in which ways should we practice? Should we have someone interviewing us? Should we just review questions on our own? What would you recommend? Both, both, okay. but definitely, the, definitely the, the back and forth. The, uh, uh, there's, only, there's only so much improvement you can do if you're just reading questions on your own. So the interaction uh, is very important. So whether it's a pre-med advisor, uh, you might ask that favor of a physician that you've been shadowing, or even somebody who's not in medicine. It's the thinking on your feet and being able to express yourself and communicate your ideas that you need practice with. And so just looking at questions by yourself won't, uh, won't, won't quite polish those skills. Uh, I'll say this on our uh, website. Um, I've also written an essay on medical school interview tips. And so I invite you all to, again, go to OSU College of Medicine, uh, our webpage, and then go to the admissions site and we've got a lot of things on there to, uh, that are meant really to be helpful to you. One of the things on there is uh, an essay on medical school interview tips. Okay, perfect. Um, and then you kind of touched on this, Divya. He mentioned mock interviews, go ahead and reach out to an advisor or one of your mentors to kind of help go through practice scenarios there. Okay, so Kip, is inside the audience and he actually asked a great question when he registered and he's wondering how to answer why becoming a physician um, how should one practice this answer and what should we think of in terms of timing structure and nonverbal communication well so what we hope is that in terms of nonverbal communication we hope that this uh, gets you excited we hope that when we ask this question we see a spark in your eyes uh, mm -hmm. and we see some enthusiasm um, in terms of uh, uh, how to, to answer it, you, you, you've got your own motivation. So uh, each of you listening to me right now, uh, if you were to just ask yourself, why do you want to be a physician? I mean, that's a good question. Um, uh, and and, and that, is, that is your answer. Uh, don't worry about it if it sounds like anybody else's answer. There are, um, there are 44 to 45,000 people applying to medical school every year. And there are probably 45,000 different answers to that question. So uh, the reason that I want to be a doctor is different from the reason Lauren wants to be a doctor is different from the reason Kip wants to be a doctor. But um, you want to you make it sound, you definitely want to say that you want to help people in your own way. I mean, it sounds kind of trite. Everybody says that, but say it in your own way with your own words. And it's also important to say that you want to help people through medicine. You want to help people by uh, treating uh, people uh, and preventing diseases, but you want to help through medicine. And that's important because there are some snarky admissions committee members out there that, you know, when you say, well, uh, I want to help people, that's why I want to be a doctor, that will say to you, well, teachers help people, Uber drivers help people, firemen help people, why do you want to be a doctor? So I want to be a doctor because I want to help people through the practice of medicine. I want to I want to I want to uh, treat people who are sick. Um, I want to use science to come up with cures and prevent disease, uh, etc. 
Perfect. Great question and answer. And so Harsha, this is kind of oh, another Ohio State University student. So this kind of builds off of Kip's answer and how do we answer why a doctor specifically and not one of the other healthcare professionals? Good question. So we, we actually get, uh, you know, we occasionally have uh, nurses or nurse practitioners or physician's assistants applying to medical school. And um, the, the, uh, the answer is, and you have to work this out on your own, but the answer is that the ultimate responsibility usually falls on the shoulders of the physician. Uh, in a way that it doesn't fall on the shoulders of the nurse practitioner or the physician's assistant. And so I'll tell you, when we've had nurses who apply to medical school, um, their whole reason for applying to medical school is an answer to this question. So they say, you know, in this position, and this goes with any of the healthcare fields, the allied healthcare fields, in their position as a pharmacist or as a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, they were a member of the team uh, helping the patient and they had a certain amount of medical knowledge, but there was a ceiling, uh, there was a limit to the amount of medical knowledge they had. And then they observed the doctor, the doctor had a deeper level of knowledge and the ultimate responsibility uh, for that patient's uh, outcomes. So uh, that is, those are some of the differences between uh, a physician and other allied healthcare professionals. Now, uh, it's important uh, that you understand that. And um, you might even, if you really think you are confused, uh, uh, not confused, but if you're not sure, you just know you wanna be um, in a field where you're working in healthcare and, uh, and helping to heal the sick, but you're not sure what you wanna do, then it actually makes sense to shadow different kinds of healthcare providers. Cause you might shadow a physician and you might shadow a nurse practitioner and you might actually decide that being a nurse practitioner is more to your liking. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And let's see, Cody here is wondering, what skills should I seek to glean from an MD or DO program as a student, and how do I assess those? Hmm. Uh, so I'm going to guess what, what he's asking is, uh, what are you looking to get from an MD versus a DO school? And so I'll answer it this way. And if, that's, if, I'm, if I'm taking your question the wrong way, then just, uh, just repost. Um, I can tell you MD and DO schools are essentially equivalent in terms of the material that has to be mastered. DO schools have a bit more of an emphasis on nutrition than MD schools and a bit more of, a nutrition, of, a, of an emphasis on uh, holistic uh, care. Um, and, and there are some uh, methods and techniques of osteopathy that doctors graduating from MD schools are not taught. Um, however, they are considered equivalent. And in fact, you, uh, you might be interested to know that uh, previously and even now, there were separate residency training programs. There was a body that oversaw residencies for graduates of DO schools and a body that oversees residencies for graduates of MD schools. Um, those two are merging. They're merging in 2020. So there's only gonna be one overall organization for residency training programs. And that is a sign that actually by the medical establishment, these two are really considered equivalent. Okay, perfect. Thank you for discussing that. Okay, and Mary is wondering, does an applicant have an edge over others if they've completed a master's program prior to applying to medical school? It depends. It depends on the reason for getting the master's. If, they, uh, if a student uh, went into a master's degree program to uh, improve their academic metrics because their undergraduate uh, metrics were not as strong, then uh, that could be a very smart thing to do. In fact, we usually will encourage students to do that uh, who had some stumbling in their uh, undergraduate academic record. Simply having a master's degree itself um, uh, certainly doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't necessarily help you. So in other words, uh, if, uh, if, if somebody is a very competitive applicant and all they're going to have is their bachelor's degree, they're not necessarily at a disadvantage because they don't have their master's in biochemistry or their master's in physiology. So it can help you in specific circumstances where you needed to show 
that you can do high level uh, scientific work, it can help you. But if you've already shown that you can do uh, a good job in the classroom with your undergraduate studies, then a master's degree is not necessary. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Let's see. And T is wondering which master's programs or post back programs are most versatile and helpful for med schools. Do you have any specific programs that you guys um, receive more applicants from who are successful in transitioning or how should one go about looking for one of these programs to apply to? So, uh, so I'll, I'll start by saying this, um, do what's best for you, what your finances dictate and what your personal circumstances dictate because uh, everybody, everybody will be looked at as an individual. Um, but let me, uh, let me rank for you uh, the value that I personally place on, let's say training after the graduate, after the undergraduate degree. I'd say number one, that the, uh, the option that is most useful and most helpful is one of these one year uh, SMPs, they're called special master's programs. These are one year master's degrees in things like, usually they call them a master's degree in medical science or master's degree in medical physiology or what have you. Uh, the specific SMPs are valuable because they are usually at a university that has a medical school. And usually in that one year master's program, the students are taking some of the very same courses that the first year medical students are taking. And with the special master's program, your letter of recommendation from that program will usually put your performance, um, uh, compare it to the performance of the first year medical school class. So for instance, it might say um, in uh, medical microbiology in this master's degree program, Quinn Capers had an exam average of 85 and that places him exactly in the 50th percentile of our first year medical students. So that's very valuable because if you have an undergraduate record uh, where you weren't able to show your best work and admissions committees have some doubt about whether or not you can do medical school level work, here they have in their hand a letter of recommendation saying that you went toe to toe with medical students and you held your own. So that takes away all of the concern that they have. So I like those special master's programs for that reason. There are examples uh, all around. In Ohio, we have one at University of Cincinnati. There's one at University of Toledo. Uh, one of the uh, oldest ones is at Georgetown University. Uh, there's one, uh, I believe, at Drexel. Uh, you can Google these, SMPs or Special Master's Programs. I would place that at the top of the heap. Second would be a master's program that's not one of these Special Master's Program, but it's just a one or two year master's degree in a biomedical science, uh, like anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, uh, that just gives you an opportunity to, again, prove to medical school admissions committees that you can do the high level uh, science coursework and do well. Uh, the uh, third, uh, in my opinion, would be a post back program, a formal post back program where you are a full-time student for one or two years taking uh, upper level undergraduate science courses. And these are the kind that were really meant for people who are career changers. So if somebody was an engineer for a few years or they worked in business and they decide they wanna to go to medical school, they've gotta get their pre-med prerequisites in, they do one of these uh, and then they're uh, prepared to take the MCAT. So I would place that third and the only reason I place it underneath the master's degrees is because it's undergraduate work as opposed to graduate school work. And it is universally accepted that graduate school you have to have a little more critical thinking and you do a little more reading than an undergraduate. Uh, the fourth would be what I call an a la carte post back program where you're working, you don't have time and you can't afford to, to stop working and do a full year of, uh, of uh, being a full-time student taking undergraduate courses. So you do the best you can. You know, while you're working, you might take a biochemistry a three credit biochemistry course this semester. Next semester, you take another course. The next semester, you take another course. And you just do your, your best to, to cobble it together the best that you can. Uh, that shows effort, uh, but, uh, but admissions committee members might ask, well, this is great that Quinn got these A's when he was taking these classes one at a time. But what we really wanna know is 
how will he handle it if he's taking 18 credit hours at once or mm -hmm. 25 credit hours at once or 30 credit hours at once? You know, being in medical school is almost the equivalent of taking 30 credit hours. Um, so, 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 so uh, that's, uh, that, th those are my thoughts uh, on those. This is just one man's thought. You might talk to pre-med advisors who think differently, other admissions deans who think differently. Uh, but I've just given you uh, my ranking of the value I place uh, on, uh, on each of those programs where you are continuing your education beyond the undergraduate degree. Perfect. And let's see. So Armin, Dr. Capers kind of covered that there. So that is the end of our previously submitted questions. So Dr. Capers, I'm gonna go ahead and go through some of these questions that were submitted in the chat. If you don't mind, maybe we'll do about another 10 minutes or so. I don't mind, yep, because I was late, Perfect. so I'm happy to. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. So let's see what we have submitted here. Okay, so Lauren Mason brings up a really good question a little while back, and she's wondering what resources should we look at to become well-versed in current healthcare issues? Um, are there any specific topics you think we should look into before an interview? So in terms of uh, uh, healthcare topics, uh, you can't go wrong with uh, reading uh, some of the, 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 the really well-read medical journals, such as uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. That's probably the most uh, uh, highest read, highest impact factor journal. And uh, while they might have some uh, really detailed uh, medical facts in them, they also have just kind of general overall, this is what's happening in healthcare today, articles in them. And so reading those can help you be knowledgeable about some of the big uh, things going on in healthcare related to healthcare reform and Medicaid reform, et cetera. Okay, perfect. And let's see. Okay, Jocelyn Munoz posted an interesting question and she's wondering that if you know a current or past medical student for a school that you're interviewing for, should you let them know? Like your interview, interviewer. Uh, so so uh, it, it's the question, uh, if, if you're a candidate and you're interviewing at medical school A and you know mm -hmm. A, a current student at medical school A, should you let them know? Yeah, or like a current question? faculty member or someone affiliated with the school. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, there's no, there's no harm in doing that. Um, whether or not it will help you, it's, it, I mean, it, it just depends. Uh, it, it may not help you, but it certainly won't hurt. Okay, perfect. And let's see. So how do you guys over at Ohio State University School of Medicine look at traditional and non-traditional pre-meds? Do you have any differences that you look for between those two groups? We, we still want you to be strong in experiences, attributes, and metrics, but we uh, value uh, uh, the non-traditional uh, applicant. And for those who don't know, non-traditional is essentially applying to anybody who uh, didn't go the traditional route, which is graduate from college and then within a few months start medical school. So if that's not you, then you are considered non-traditional. Um, and of course, there's a wide range of non-traditional. Some people worked in a different field for 10 years before going to medical school. That's very non-traditional. Others may have, take, might have taken a, a one or two year uh, gap year. So um, we find it valuable. Uh, our medical school, like uh, most now, in addition to lectures, we have small group discussions uh, for uh, our educating medical students. And the discussion is rich when you have a diversity of backgrounds uh, in that group. If everybody in the group is a 21 year old who just graduated from college, um, then their knowledge level about things in the world is about the same. But if you've got uh, in there some people who worked in different fields first, some people who took some years off, but didn't go into medical school, uh, that can really be enlightening in those conversations. So for that reason, we value what the non-traditional student can bring to our medical school class. Okay, perfect. And Aglaya and Risha, I see you both kind of have similar questions in here regarding research and how it's viewed. Um, do you guys have any preference to which field of research a student kind of participates in, whether it be biomedical, public health with the NIH, or maybe chemistry? Um, how do you guys perceive those differences? Uh, no, no difference to us. Research is asking a question and then taking the steps to answer that question. So. Um, it doesn't have to be medically related research. 
it doesn't even have to be science. It doesn't even have to be science related research. We've had some uh, English majors uh, apply and their research was related to more a humanities topic. So um, uh, doing research shows critical thinking, shows that you can problem solve, uh, but we really don't care. We really don't care what the field of research is. Okay, perfect. And uh, Jenny here is wondering if any pre-med prereqs are ever considered outdated. Do you guys have a time frame in which all prereqs must be completed by? Um, I have to go back and look at our rules and regulations because this is something that uh, that doesn't come up very often. And the reason it doesn't come up very often because uh, most of the prerequisites for medical school are also the prerequisites for the MCAT. So for instance, if you graduated 10 years ago and you took your general biology 10 years ago, uh, you probably wouldn't want to simply rely on that uh, to take your MCAT. You would want to take a refresher course in biology. So it doesn't come up too often that somebody's courses are so old uh, that they're going to just take the MCAT fresh and apply to medical school. Usually, uh, if, they, uh, if it's been more than five years uh, or so, uh, they're going to want to take some refresher courses anyway. So it doesn't come up that much with us, but there are some schools that uh, just like your MCAT can expire uh, after three years at some schools. Mm -hmm. There are some schools that say, well, you took these uh, prerequisites uh, uh, too long ago. Uh, you're going to need to retake them. Uh, at Ohio State, uh, we don't have a firm uh, policy on that. And, and, and like I said, though, it usually takes care of itself. If, if that organic chemistry you took was 10 years ago, uh, you're going to want to take a refresher before you take the MCAT. <laughs> okay, perfect. And I know that OSU is very research oriented. And so I'm sure during an interview, if you have any research experience, you'd like to discuss any potential publications. And Lala Forrest here is saying, how should she address a manuscript that was submitted and rejected for publication? Oh, I would simply say that, uh, that explain your research, explain mm -hmm. what you did, say that you went through the process of writing it up and submitting it, and it has not yet been accepted. Um, you know, getting rejected, all of us who write uh, research papers have that experience. I guarantee you there is no published researcher that has had every paper accepted. So uh, uh, welcome to the club if you've had a paper rejected. And um, um, uh, the, the main thing is that you did a project and you wrote it up and you submitted it. And right. as we all know, if journal number one rejects it, then there's always journal number two, <laughs> and number three, and you keep going. Um, and, but also taking into account what, the, uh, uh, what the, those reviewers and editors say to you so you can improve the quality of your product. Right, exactly. And I can personally attest to this. I did recently just have a paper published. And just because it gets rejected from one journal doesn't mean you can't modify it and get accepted in another. So definitely look forward to the future on that, Lala Forest. And let's see, Jamal is wondering, let's see, how does one discuss a setback without sounding like a victim? Uh, good question. Um, I would say the best way to do that is uh, after discussing what your setback was, uh, then focus on how you overcame it and what you learned from it going forward. And even better, how going through uh, that difficult time is going to help you help others. Perfect. And let's go ahead and end with this one last question here from Sal. He's wondering, how much does it matter who writes a recommendation letter? And is there a preference for a professor over a physician or a graduate student? Um, or how should we approach looking for letter writers? So uh, this one will be one that you'll need to check with individual schools because individual schools have different requirements. At Ohio State, we want three letters. Two letters we want them to be from professors who had you in class. One of those we want to be science. The other one can be from uh, whoever you want. It can be from your uh, uh, humanities professor, if you like, or your art professor. The third we want to be uh, kind of a character reference, and that can be from just about anybody. It can be from a doctor that you shadow. That's valuable. It can be from a supervisor at work. Those can be valuable. We've even had them from coaches, from sports teams. Um, if research is a big part of your application, then definitely 
one of those letters should be from your research advisor. But check with each medical school. Uh, we require three. Some medical schools want four. Some only want two. Uh, and, and they will actually tell you on their website um, who they want those letters to be from. So that is an individual medical school by medical school answer. OK, perfect. And I know I said that would be our last question, but I see an awesome question just came in from Helena real quick. And she's wondering, if you're still trying to raise your GPA, whether it be through your senior year or a post back program, is it advisable to apply before you have all of your courses finished, or would you advise that they wait until they're able to prove that they're able to bring up their GPA? One of the biggest mistakes that students make applying to medical school is being in too big of a rush. Okay. So uh, if your academic record does not show uh, your potential and what you can do, and you have a plan to take some courses to prove what you can do, then the best thing you can do is be patient and wait until you've amassed enough credit hours uh, that will counteract uh, maybe a lackluster performance. So if you uh, have uh, you know, 60 credit hours and a GPA that is, uh, let's say, not competitive for medical school, say a 2.0, then uh, getting two A's uh, is not going to counteract that. You need to be patient and wait till you've built a record that can counteract that. Okay, perfect. Great advice. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you so much, Dr. Capers. We're so glad you were able to join us tonight. Everyone, go ahead and say a big thank you in the chat. And I just want to remind you all that this was recorded and we'll post it for you guys to review. Um, I just want to wish you all 